as I recall, because I haven't read the, I mean, I, I don't reread, I don't sit down and reread my books. I mean, I've, so as I recall, the point of the clue train was, in fact, that um, the coverage of the internet by the media, in particular, fo was focusing almost exclusively on the internet as a business opportunity, as a commercial space, and we wanted to say what we thought every user of the internet knew, which is, yeah, business is great, we're glad it's there, but that's not what's driving us. It's not what's driving people onto the internet. It's not why the internet is transformative, and transformative of our lives and our culture. I mean, it's a really important thing. Um, so, absolutely, the bubble came and went, um, but Clutrain was not about the bubble. It wasn't saying what's important about the internet is that lots of dot-coms are going to start up. It was saying the opposite. It was saying that what's important about the internet is that it's a place in which human beings get to speak in their own voices about what matters to them, as opposed to having to listen to broadcast TV and radio, as opposed to having only um, published, paper published journals to read. Um, it was, this was a, our chance, this was our space to talk about what mattered to us and to connect with other people. Seems to me that that's, if I'm correct in my memory of what the book said, that this is exactly what has continued to be important about the internet. Uh, and blogging, to come back to blogging, and blogging which we didn't know about, know about in 1999, um, is a wonderful example of, of what we were trying to say we thought the values, the value of the internet was. Well, the, the web is going to force changes in public relations and blogs as a part of that, but it's, um, before blogs, public relations was already, the techniques and the assumptions of public relations already didn't make sense for um, a networked world. Um, the assumption had been that, this is for about a hundred years, that businesses thought, uh, correctly thought actually, that they could control much of their market by selectively releasing information. The businesses were the only ones with information about their products. If you wanted to know about the products or services, you had to go to the company, and they would tell you only what they wanted you to know. And in that environment, um, you can shape messages and try to influence behavior that way. Um, there's, there's great cost to doing that. There's a social cost to doing that. Um, it's a very alienating technique. Um, it, it, moves people away, it distances them from the products in the company because nobody likes being messaged, nobody likes receiving these, these simplistic um, ideas that everybody knows aren't realistic, um, which is why marketers have had to try to force messages on us um, every place that they can against our will, in advertisements, in billboards. And, um, with the internet in general, and then blogging in particular, um, markets are networked, they're in conversation, they're literally talking uh, with one another, and it turns out, not surprisingly, well, maybe a little surprisingly, that networked customers know more about products than the businesses do. We're more honest with each other, for one thing. We, we don't have any self-interest the way businesses even the best intentioned businesses do. Um, we're, we tell each other the truth, we do so in ways that are interesting to one another, because that's, we stop listening, we have conversations that are interesting, we give up on them. Um, and it turns out that because networked markets are so large, they contain people who are, are amazing experts, and we listen to them, and we learn from them. So networked markets literally know more than the companies do. And so the old techniques of marketing, including PR, that tries to control markets by limiting knowledge, that's simply, that's over, it simply doesn't work anymore. It's very hard. Um, it is a very different way of thinking. There, there have always been better and worse PR companies. There are some that are cynical and ruthless and only are interested in shaping a message no matter how false it is. Um, there aren't many that are that depraved. Um, they have served other roles as well in advising companies on how to 
<clears throat> and how to talk and how to communicate and what people will hear. And, um, so it's not at all as starkly evil as, as the worst of PR is. I mean, the worst of PR, from my point of view, shows up in politics, where the, the effect isn't simply that you buy a brand of soap that you didn't really want, but your democracy is destroyed. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, there are examples of terrible, terrible PR. I think most of the, of the PR companies are not like that. Um, they're, they're far better than that. But yes, it is, very, it is a very difficult thing for the public relations industry to unlearn the lessons that it's been learning for 100 years. Um, I, can, I continue to believe that hyperlinks sub, uh, subvert hierarchies. Not absolutely, and then other types of hierarchies emerge. Nevertheless, even at the, even at the simple level of email, um, the internet has started to subvert the traditional hierarchy of, of power. The email is a great leveler. Um, it is easy to send email up and down the pyramid of power, um, and likewise for blogs, it's very hard to predict who is going to be the or who will be the good bloggers in a corporation or anywhere. Um, it's actually unlikely that the CEO is going to be a particularly good blogger. It's uh, entirely possible that somebody who is too shy to speak in public will reveal that she in fact has a depth of, of knowledge and expertise and wisdom that emerges in a web blog and so now she becomes um, a, a new type of authority not one who pronounces from high up in the pyramid, but one who links, who shares information, who um, acts like a human being, who admits being wrong and learn, and, and is capable of learning. And this is the type of authority that I think we want. Um, and pyramids, hierarchies tend not to give us that type of, of, of authority. The issue with politics and government is that those are the most entrenched hierarchies ever. They have no product except power. I mean, businesses have something else to do other than accumulate power. They want to sell stuff. Governments and, and politicians, their only product is power. So those are, will be, unfortunately, the last of the hierarchies that will be able to pull down through, through links and through conversation. Um, I, I don't know what will happen. I only hope that we'll manage to do it in time. The Dean campaign tried to um, get over the, the normal pyramid of power in a campaign to some reasonable extent by empowering users. So rather than having a message and trying to beat that into the heads of the users, excuse me, of the supporters, so the supporters would go out and repeat the message, they instead told supporters to talk about what they wanted, to use their own words, to, to disagree with the candidate. They enable supporters to find one another online and in the real world, to form groups around shared interests, to, to um, take over the meaning of the campaign. This, is, this was remarkable. It was a real um, economy of trust, which is the opposite of what we get all the time in every other campaign, where supporters aren't trusted and the candidate isn't trusted. The candidate is not allowed to say anything that is off message. You know, it is not the packaged message of the day. Um, it's a disaster if the candidate should ever say anything off message. Well, blogs are always off message. It's the only way they're interesting is that they're off message. And the Dean web blog, which was the centerpiece of the campaign, was not written by Dean. It was written by a supporter, a mm -hmm. bunch of supporters, um, who signed their own name. Nobody thought it was Dean writing this. Uh, they were always, they were delightfully off message. They were clearly supporters like the rest of us getting a chance to talk and that was such a gesture of trust that it gave an enormous sense of relief to supporters who are so used to being treated like like chattel, like meat. Mm -hmm. um, the lesson that the Kerry campaign learned from this though is simply that the internet is a good way to raise money for free. I disagree with many of my friends on this topic, which leads me to suspect that I'm deeply wrong about it. Nevertheless, first of all, 
um, the times when you actually need to identify somebody to know who that person in real life is are quite small. Um, when I buy something with credit card, I don't have to show my ID. So in the real world and online as well, many of the transactions, the people, we can accomplish many of the transactions without having to become identified. Uh, credit cards are, are like that. There is tremendous pressure now, which generally is not coming from users, to solve all problems by creating a regime of complete, perfect, traceable identity. Instead, so I, I, as I think there are problems with that. Um, instead, what it seems to me we need are solutions that are appropriate to the, the many, many different sorts of transactions we have on the web. And a very large number of, a very high percentage of transactions, of, including taking email as a transaction. <clears throat> Pseudonymity works very well. Having pseudonyms works very well for reputation systems. I don't know the identity of the person I buy from, from eBay. I don't know the identity of the person who's writing the Wikipedia article. Um, if there's any, Wikipedia might be totally anonymous, but frequently it's a pseudonym the person has made up. The pseudonym is enough for me to decide whether or not I trust that person. I can see that this pseudonym has had 99.9% .9 successful transactions at eBay, that the pseudonym has written 500 good articles at Wikipedia. Pseudonyms satisfy most needs most of the time without having the bad effects of a hard identity system. The hard identity system is useful in a handful of cases where we really need to be able to trace this back to an individual, but it's being implemented in hardware and in software in a way that it will, will, be, will be pervasive. And among the bad effects of that, there are some social, social bad effects that I worry about that are very hard to predict. It's hard to tell how this is going to change things. But politically, there are some disastrous effects. Because hard ID makes some sense in, in open societies um, for some small, but handing the system to, to, to say, the Chinese, who have an interest in making sure that the internet is closed, that they can track every dissenting voice, you might as well just, you know, uh, it, it, it's a, a, a disaster for human rights. So the, we absolutely will get some benefit from having hard ID systems, but the, um, the benefit I think is way smaller than we're being told. And the bad consequences I think are overwhelming. It means that the internet will no longer be the hope of dissidents in countries that provide no rights. And I don't think we should be willing to hand that tool. I think Web 2, the Internet 2.0 idea has one thing right and one thing wrong. Um, the, the right part is it points to the way in which it's far easier now to build applications that use applications already out there. You can build something using Google Maps and Flickr photos and snap it all together. And information is far more available and structured in, in ways that computers can use it. And that is really, really, that's really important. The part of it that I disagree with is the notion that now with Internet 2.0 or Web 2.0, <clears throat> now citizens, ordinary citizens can participate, that finally humans have a voice on the Internet. And that seems to me just historically wrong. You have to explain why that first billion people came onto the internet before Internet 2.0. And we came on not because we wanted to buy books on Amazon. We came on because it was our place for talking about what mattered to us. The web has always been driven by human participation, human voice, and human connection. I don't think that's new in Internet 2.0. Weblogs, which are five or six years old, so it's not like a new thing, have been a very important evolutionary step in making it easier for anybody to get their words up on, on the internet. <clears throat> but the notion that only now humans are entering the internet seems to me to be just cockeyed and wrong. So two negatives. <laughs> so the thing that's happening that's very disturbing is that industries that cannot survive 
because they no longer provide value. We don't need the recording industry to manufacture plastic discs and distribute them anymore. Um, we don't need them to edit, to, to filter music for us. We can do that ourselves better. So they don't provide value, but they're trying to stay in business by um, changing the basic way that computers and the internet work so that they can continue to provide their own sorts of value. And that, there's a danger that the internet may be killed by the, a coalition of software and opera providers and hardware providers and some of the industries that, that you mentioned and by governments that have, um, who want to provide a secure, want to make us secure, but are willing to, from my point of view, sacrifice too many of the rights, <clears throat> who don't value, who don't recognize the value of anonymity. For the, so we're, we are in danger of losing the internet in order to help keep the money in the system. And that would be a, a disastrous mistake. The thing that I'm afraid, the business model I'm afraid of, says, okay, we'll have, we'll have Vista, we'll have Intel chips, we'll have and Apple as well. Um, <clears throat> we'll have law, all of which will make it impossible to view anything except on the terms um, that you're required to accept by the owner. So there's no tra retransmission, reuse, or remixing. And so the temptation then will be to move to a rental model. And there, there are good things about a rental model for content, for music, for example. Um, the bad side of it is if I have to think that every time I want to play a, a song, that it's going to cost me a nickel or whatever, then we're going to lose something important in culture. In one sense, it's very fair. Every time I play a song, I'm deriving more value from it, and so people ought to be paid. That's a fairness argument. But it's a fairness argument that we've never, ever honored. And to our benefit, we have it, to everybody's benefit, because we couldn't. You couldn't know, if you wrote a book, you couldn't know that I read it a second time and charged me for it. But now you can. With that reader, you'll be able to know every turn of the page. And so I'm afraid that the content owners will make a fairness argument, appeal to our sense of fairness, and we'll end up with a model where we have micropayments for every use of culture. And that will kill culture. Culture needs that looseness, that ambiguity, that unfairness, if you want. I listened to that record a hundred times and I only paid for it once. Good! That's the only way we're going to survive. So I, I'm worried about that argument. It's a very hard one to contradict because it seems ethical and moral, but it, it's not. And in fact, this, uh, the, the original notion of copyright in the U.S. Constitution said that it was, <clears throat> the original term of copyright was 14 years. So what that says is our U.S. founders said that after 14 years, it's fair to pay the author every, for every use for 14 years. Suddenly at 14 years, you stop paying. Well, it still would be fair to pay him, but it's important for culture that we stop paying, that we have this element of unfairness, if you want, because that's the only way our culture will be able to build on itself. The idea of the book is that for at least 2,500 years in the West, we've, um, we've organized ideas and knowledge using the same principles by which we organize things. Um, and that's because we've expressed ideas and knowledge in things. So we organize books on a shelf. Um, and likewise, we've built hierarchies of, of knowledge um, by d dividing and subdividing objects the way that we sort our laundry. And that's obviously a very powerful way of proceeding, but it's also very limited. It's limited by physical limitations we no longer need because everything's being digitized. So the book wonders what happens to knowledge, and in particular to the authority of knowledge, when we're in a digital world in which things can be um, sorted and organized by users at the last minute in any way that they want to, including in, tre in hierarchical trees that they want. So rather than having experts control it and build these hierarchies, we're building huge piles of miscellaneous objects, rich with metadata, that users can sort and order in their own way. Well, what does that do to the traditional institutions that have managed knowledge for us and to the authority of knowledge? That's why everything is missing.